Well, it's a blessing to see you in the house of the Lord today. Thank you for coming to be with us in the service this morning. If you have your Bibles, open them, please, to Judges chapter 7. Today we're going to depart from the dismantled when God gets real serious for this message today. I felt the Holy Spirit leading me in this direction today. The title of the sermon today is Turning Terrors into Trophies. Turning Terrors into Trophies. You see, I believe that if you have a terror in your life, you have also an unclaimed trophy. If you have terror in your life, then you have an unclaimed trophy. Why? Because there's victory in Jesus. Come on, stand to your feet one more time and then I'll let you sit. Judges chapter 7. Look at verse 24. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take them before the waters unto Beth Arba and Jordan. Probably the reason he designated this spot was it was perhaps the only place that they could cross the Jordan River at this time. It was probably the shallowest, most likely place that they would cross. And that's why he said, go to that part. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Arba and Jordan, verse 25. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the, mount, upon the rock Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I would ask for your help today. I know that in this room there are things that are a terror to each of us. They may not all be the same fears, but there are things that causes us to fear. And I pray that today you would change our thinking, that we would not see terror, but we would see trophies, and that you would give us the strength to change that, to make the metamorphosis, because it is largely within our own power to turn terrors into trophies. And I ask it in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. After the initial route of the Midianites by Gideon and his 300-man army of nomads, the Midianites who had been coming into Israel for many, many years and raiding and pillaging and looting, sensing they had lost the battle, fled. And when Gideon saw that the Midianites were running away or retreating or fleeing, he sent messengers to the men of Ephraim, those who had not been permitted to join in the battle because God had separated them out. Yet he sent for them to come out and to help with this mop-up operation, this search and destroy mission. The Bible tells us that of the number of the Midianites who fled were two of the Midianite generals of that great raiding army. One of them's name was Oreb and the other was Zeb. Now these were not likely the actual names of these two men. I believe that this was an assumed name that they had taken upon themselves they had given themselves these two names because it pleased their ego and enhanced their reputation. Because Orab means raven and Zeb means wolf. So I believe these men most likely had cha chosen the names of these two animals as their own because they wanted to be feared for their cunning, their cruelty, and their skill in war and pillage. Because when you would say the name Raven in antiquity, people most likely could see in their mind's eye because it was a common sight to them, the bodies of people lying and being picked by a raven 
eaten, his beak dripping with gore, blood on his feathers as he feasted on the bodies of the slain. That was probably the, um, the image that would accompany the word raven. They also were familiar with the wolf because they were a sheep herding group of people and they knew how the wolf would come in and catch the bleeding lamb and tear it to shreds while it cried pitifully and then devour its carcass with blood on its front feet and the wolf's mouth bloody and dripping with gore as he consumed the lamb. And it seems that they had achieved their purpose for the Bible tells us of the fear that the Israelites had of the army of the Midianites led by these two bloodthirsty individuals. In Judges chapter 6 and verse 2, we are told that this fear was so great that Israel would voluntarily go into hiding in the mountains and the caves every year when they knew the Midianites were on their way. Israel had watched these two men sentence their friends and their relatives to deaths of every cruel stripe. Beheadings, hangings, disembowelment, perhaps even crucifixions and impalement. They had witnessed the cruelty and greediness of these men, how they had raped the wives and daughters of many of the Hebrews and taken all their possessions, showing no hint of mercy or benevolence. Men spoke in cautious whispers about the raven and the wolf. There might be merciful soldiers in the Midianite army, but the two generals, oh God, help you if you should ever be captured and stand before the raven or the wolf. Perhaps many a time a poor Israelite had stumbled into a familiar hiding place, bleeding, missing both hands or arms, their tongues cut from their mouths. Poor, unfortunate souls could be found wallowing in a pool of their own blood, their entrails falling out of the gaping wounds in their abdomen. Men whose eyes had been gouged out, staggered through the war-ravaged streets of the villages, chained together with no one to guide them or care for them until someone of their number would become unable to continue and collapse. And then all of them would perish from starvation and thirst because they were blind and chained together. One could often hear the screams of the unfortunate women as they were abused and killed by these de demented vagabonds. Pregnant women were sometimes found dead, their womb ripped open and the fetus lying cruelly slaughtered close by, mother and child in a mixture of their own bodily fluids. At night, the sky would be lit as bright as noonday by the fires of the burning villages that the army under the leadership of the raven and the wolf kindled for their own amusement and entertainment. The heads of countless Israelite victims were placed in gory piles at prominent places in the city to decay in the sweltering heat, to be stripped by their flesh, by the vultures and dragged away and scattered by feral canines. In addition to these atrocities, it is likely that the Midianites often captured Israeli youth, both male and female, and sold them into slaves. For these people were slave traders even as far back as the time of Joseph. Because it was to the Midianites that his brothers sold Joseph and they sold him in Egypt. No wonder that the names of these two tyrants caused terror in the hearts of every Israelite. The havoc and destruction that accompanied this horde of humanity was made even worse by the hunger and poverty that stayed behind long after the Midianites had gone for the year. And the knowledge that these events would repeat itself again next year at harvest time must have been a living terror. If one was unfortunate enough to survive this year, he would most likely would not make it through next year because the raven and the wolf would be back. These men were great men of might and intelligence. They could recognize hiding places. They knew how to interrogate their captives and how to extract information out of them through their use of hostility and brutality. Even friends and family members could no longer be trusted to not betray one another because if they fell into the hands of the raven and the wolf, they would be tortured into revealing the answers that were sought. These men were thorough and methodical, deliberate and diabolical. They were relentless and fearless. The mention of their names would cause grown men to grow pale and women to shriek in terror. 
These were the stuff of nightmares. It caused sleeplessness. It seemed as if their agents were everywhere. No one could stand before these men. If an Israelite saw the face of either the raven or the wolf, it was likely to be the last thing he ever saw. They were the terror masters of their day. Do we not, friends, also have terrors that haunt us? Entities and situations that cause us to shudder when even we consider it just for a moment. Scenarios that we believe would be the most catastrophic event in our lives ever. Perhaps we have watched friends, parents, siblings, or acquaintances go through things that has stricken us with terror thinking, what if that should be my lot in life? Perhaps you have watched marriages break up. People go through divorce. And that is a terror to you as you recall the tears, the frustration, the emotional trauma, the physical distress caused by that event. Or perhaps you have watched bonds of matrimony dissolved, torn apart by disease. And in our minds we fear that every illness is the one that will end life as we know it. We are scared out of our mind, alarmed at every little abnormal, abnormality, worried sick that disease or tragedy will take away our companion, afraid that we will be left alone to face life, raise the kids, provide for the needs of the household. These things to us is the stuff of nightmares and the epitome of terror. Maybe it's a financial trouble or fear of it, dear sir, that keeps you awake at night and keeps you from having peace. We all know that our nation is on unstable economic ground in the long term, and perhaps that is a terror that haunts you night and day. Whatever your terror is, you see it in your dreams. It stays alive in your mind. The fear of it causes you to search continuously for safeguards. But it seems that there is no sure place where the fear of these terrors cannot invade and destroy your world. You're almost certain that one day you will have to say with Job through tears, the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Precious saint, beloved of our Lord, are you aware that there are sins to be dealt with still in your life? Are you battling passions that are so great that at times they overpower you and rule you and cause you to do great mischief to the name and body of Christ? Perhaps it is that anger that is so violent that it takes you hostage at times and forces you to say things that you wish you could take back later. It causes you to make rash decisions that you later regret and cannot undo. You know as a believer you should mortify that temper as Paul writes in Romans 8 13 and Colossians 3 5 through 9 but it seems that it takes you captive at will and you fear lest the sins spoken of in Colossians 3 5 and 9 namely fornication uncleanness inordinate affection evil concupiscence and covetousness idolatry anger wrath malice blasphemy filthy communication and lying all of these things you fear lest they should sabotage your salvation and cause you to be lost. And it is a valid terror because many strong men and women has been slain by sin and fell from the grace of God into lasciviousness. But perhaps the terror for you is so great concerning these things and the struggles that you have at times in your life that you you feel that it's a hopeless case, that the tempter is too strong and despite your greatest efforts and faith, you will be lost. Oh, sinner friend, if there is one in the building today that don't know the Lord, let me talk to you for a moment. Your lost condition is a terror to you. You are yet in unbelief. You are lost, afraid you will die before salvation comes to you. You believe scripture and at times you tremble because of your lost condition. Eternity is a terror to you. Your hell has already begun because you are restless, anxious for the next moment to arrive and confirm to you that hope still exists. Yet you are aware that your sins shall never relinquish their grasp of you voluntarily so that you may become Christ. Oh, what a terror it is to you to think of death and hell. You cannot say with Paul, O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? 
What wretched feelings strive within you even now as I'm speaking to you. In your terror-stricken soul, it seems as if everything and everyone points at you and mutters that terrible word, lost. It pounds in your ears night and day. Lost, lost, lost. If that is you today, I tell you, you must get up. You must take the initiative. You must destroy this terror. But you say, how can I destroy it? How may I be born again? My sins hold me fast. My pride will not let me come and bow. My wretched past haunts me like a hellhound. I will give you one scripture. It's an ancient glorious scripture that will save your soul. Isaiah 45 and 22 says, Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. There is your opening. There is your opportunity to turn terror into triumph. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Look to Christ. Literally fix your gaze upon him. He is the Savior. If you will but look, you will begin to learn. If you will look, you will soon laud. If you will look, you will soon lay all your sins at his feet and he will save you. Like the poor Israelites who had murmured and transgressed and God sent fiery serpents among them that bit them and they began to perish. Moses at the instrumentality of God made a brazen serpent and put it on a pole and lifted it up and the Bible tells us in Numbers 21 that everyone who looked upon that serpent lived. They turned the terror into a trophy. Each person today in this room has his or her own set of personal terrors. Terrors of a terrestrial kind, terrors of the body, terrors of the soul, and the list is long. But I would remind you that terrors can be turned into trophies. All it takes is for us to face our fears and submit ourselves to the God of all might. And at a time of his choosing, God will destroy these villains. I can imagine the children of Ephraim demeanor and how it changed once they heard that God by 300 men had put to flight the vast armies of the Midianites when the messenger arrived and said God has wrought a miraculous victory and the Midianites are on the run how those people who heard it must have erupted into cheers and from the caves and the dens and the hiding places. Others must have came out because they anticipated by what they heard that the news were good. And the messenger said, God has wrought a great victory. But Gideon says, grab your swords and go to the fording place, the crossing place. They're on the run and there cut them down before the Lord. Oh, how those men must have grabbed frantically for their weapons and taken off at a dead sprint for the ford. Whereas only hours before, they felt alone and forsaken by God and they were quaking at the name and the thought of the raven and the wolf. Now they found certain excitements when they thought about the possibilities. I can see that man... Or those men who moments before was demoralized as they hurried with all of their might to the crossing place with their sword in their hand thinking, perhaps, perhaps I might be the one that meets the raven or the wolf if they've not been captured and it would be a mighty feat to strike off their head and bring it back to show my compatriots. So quickly did the Israelites change from the hunted to the hunter that when they did meet up with the two who had inspired so much fear in them as recently as that morning, the men of Ephraim chased the raven and the wolf and they captured and slew them and they cut their heads off. And then they hurried to where Gideon was, bringing in their hands the heads of the two men much like a hunter would drag his trophy out of the woods today. They brought the heads of these two terrorists, heads without a body. The mouth that had once spoken so many horrific things and commanded so much brutality and carnage was now eternally silent. 
The brains that had once thought up terrific and horrible atrocities were now blank and deteriorating. The eyes which once blazed with eager light of cruelty were now cold, bloodshot, and sightless. These two generals went from being terrors to being trophies, from being despots to being dispatched. For the Israelites in one day, by God's grace, turned their terrors into trophies. But I think I hear some of you, I hear your thoughts. You think, what a great story. But that cannot be me. Oh, that my enemy was flesh and blood, then I would slay him. Oh, that my enemy was tangible, then I would fight to the death. Oh, that God would conquer the enemy. But my enemy is mental, my enemy is emotional, my enemy is spiritual, my enemy is sin, flesh, carnality, the devil. Oh, God, if they just had a body. I could never be that bold. The things that frightens me are too great. I would answer you with scripture. With the scripture that I've read in your hearing, terrors can be turned into trophies by anyone who is willing to fight and pursue them. This is not limited in age or sex. Youth and children may turn their terrors into trophies. Remember David, the shepherd boy in the field who killed the fierce lion and the bear. Remember David who faced Goliath on the field of battle all alone, armed with only a sling and a staff. Recall how he slew the giant and cut off his head and brought it before King Saul. I challenge you young people in this audience today, bring me some heads. Fight, engage your terrors, and by God's grace, you can slay them. And then you can come back and say, look what God has done for me. The fear of rejection may cause many, many youths to stay in bondage. But you can turn that terror into a trophy because God is for you. Women can turn their terrors into trophies also. Remember J.L. of Judges chapter 4? How she drove a nail through the temples of Sisera when he lay down in the tent to sleep. And according to the song of Deborah, she then cut off his head and brought it to Barak, the captain of the armies of the Lord. Oh, my friends, you are strong The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And I shall not neglect to encourage even the elders among us because you also have terrors. 2 Samuel 20 tells of an older woman, if indeed the word wise in the passage implicates knowledge attained by life experience, which I believe it does. This woman saved the city of Abel from certain destruction by the hands of Joab, by persuading the citizens of that city to cut off the head of Sheba the insurrectionist and throw it out over the wall to Joab. She turned a terror into a trophy. Oh, how often we forfeit trophies because they are terrifying. Trophies that would be great testimonies for us to treasure and share forever because we simply will not confront them. Perhaps if you are in terror today, if God would grant me the power to help you through this sermon, see that terror in a different light. If you could see that thing that terrorizes you in a trophy case, if you could see it as something upon which you could stand for ages without end and say, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. If you could see that terror as a trophy that would inspire those around you. If you could see that thing that frightens you as a place for God's miraculous hand to show forth its power, then, my friend, we could turn terrors into trophies. Perhaps we should rejoice today if we are in terror, knowing the greatness of our God. 
knowing that God is able to give us strength. David wrote, by my God to have I run through a troop, and by my God to have I leaped over a wall. Think about that for a moment. There was some distress and terror in that moment. You don't run through a troop of armed men just for the fun of it. You don't jump over a wall just because you think it would be cool. Not at David's age when he wrote that psalm. Think about it. He was surrounded and the only way out was through the troop. He was backed up and the only way over and out was over the wall. And he said, yet by my God have I run through a troop and by my God have I leaped over a wall. I wish that God would give some of us the grace to leap it and leave it. To realize that he can turn the things that frighten us and the thing that pin us down and the thing that backs us up into a corner. I hope that one day I will hear many of us say to each other and to our children and grandchildren, come here. Let me share with you how this sin, this fear, this state, this condition, this situation, this addiction terrorized me until by God's grace, I slew it. And you'll hold up that head, oh, it's still ugly. It's still ugly. But it has no power now. God has conquered it. It has no strength now. It has no might now. It's a trophy by God's grace. Once again, I pray that God would help you to hold up the fierce most fierce part of that former terror and call upon all to see and rejoice. For friend, if God be for us, who can defeat us? I can assure you on the word of God that he is for you. Saints, he is for you, defeating your ever terror. Sinner, he is for you. Young person, God is for you. Man, woman, elder, God is for you, turning your terrors into trophies.